a few, a couple of nights ago, was it nights or sometime, a couple of days ago, Brother Ken um, shared some thoughts concerning the sanctuary. And today I'd like to maybe contribute a little bit to some of the things that he said and uh, maybe add a few other things. I know that um, the theme of this camp meeting is the foundations of righteousness and one of the foundations or the foundations of righteousness I believe are outlined in the Hebrew system of worship. Symbol and type, yes. Symbol and type. We need to emphasize that because sometimes that is not understood clearly enough that it's symbol but at the same time it was designed by God himself and one of the things that is certain to impress us as we look at the sanctuary as we read carefully what God said about it in fact the whole system of worship that was given in the Old Testament one of the things that impresses us is the extreme detail it amazes me and in fact the first time you read it it overwhelms you. It intimidates you. To be honest, I usually read through that part of the Bible as quickly as I could. When I was going through the Bible time and again, I just could not fathom all these details. I mean, it just seems like it's too much. And yet, you have to think that the person who designed it and who gave it intended that every part of it, every word that he said, Every intricate detail that he specified was intended to, to carry a particular meaning. And it was intended to be understood. The truth is that it has been intimidating. And very often when people attempt to study the sanctuary, those details are skipped over or they are, they are interpreted in what I consider to be a superficial way. And I believe that there is a great depth of meaning still left to be explored in not just the sanctuary, as I said, but the entire Hebrew system. So, I also believe, I'm more and more persuaded that the key to understanding the sanctuary and the whole system is to properly understand Jesus Christ. I know it was given to us so we could understand Christ. But the truth is it works both ways. As we begin to come into an understanding of what Jesus means, then light begins to shine backwards on the sanctuary and we see things there that we never saw before and they shine forward onto Christ again. So I'm one of those people who is all for studying the, the system. I, I, I'm not one who believes in practicing it like some people believe you have to, you have to actually practice the Old Testament system. You have to actually be keeping some of these things. But I believe we need to study them. Because God gave them to us so we could understand. And as we understand, then we can believe. And as we believe, we experience. That's a, that's a system God outlined. So, this morning, I want to title my little talk, The Sinner in the Sanctuary. Now, as Brother Ken pointed out, a few nights ago. It was God himself who instructed the Israelites to build the sanctuary. And he expressly stated the reason for this, this construction. He told them in Exodus 25 and verse 8, let them do what? Let them make me a sanctuary for what purpose? That I might dwell among them. So God himself defines the reason for the sanctuary. It was designed to be the dwelling place of God. Now we know that in a general sense, the presence of God is everywhere in this very room. There is no place, as the psalmist says, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. As Paul said in Acts chapter 17, in him we live and move and have our being. But in a peculiar sense, the sanctuary represents places that are to be in a peculiar sense the dwelling place of God in a special sense. And so God told Moses from the beginning that it, this was to be the purpose of the sanctuary. It was a place where God's presence could be manifested and people could know that they could come to this building and find some kind of special interaction with God. You know, it's fascinating when I think about it. If you were an Israelite living in this camp, 
The sanctuary was kind of like in a central location with, with, the, with the tribes camped on, on, on four sides. But if you got up in the night, you could look toward the sanctuary and you would see, I'm sure you could see the glare of a, of a, of a light. There was a light there before the days of electric power, before, before man discovered electricity. There was a light there shining without any power, visible power source. And this light was just constantly emanating from the most holy place of the sanctuary. So I'm sure they could see the glare of the light if you look toward the sanctuary. And it's awesome to think that if you were, if you were ever feeling lonely or discouraged or forsaken or needing some help, you could look there and you could recognize God is in that place. I mean, how much, how much would that help your faith? How much would it help your prayer life and your worship sessions? And yet, when you think about it, this was the type, the symbol, the representation. The reality is supposed to be far greater. It's a little bit daunting and discouraging to consider that. Perhaps today many people would have swapped their present experience for what the Israelites had because it seems from our present situation that they had something better and yet that was not God's purpose that's not the reality at all what that is is a statement on how little we understand the truth about what we have because that even with the physical presence of God there that they could see with their eyes even with that constant reminder that God was in the camp what we have today is as superior as the heaven is superior to the earth that's what the word of God teaches us. Now, so God himself designed the sanctuary, every detail of it, and told them how to, how to make it. And he told them the purposes that I may dwell among them. Now we find that this sanctuary was intended to represent certain realities. And one of the things that Adventists have done is to focus on one particular representation of the sanctuary more than anything else. And that's the one that we know best of all. But... If I were to ask the question, what did the sanctuary represent? What answer would you give? Christ, Sister Janet says, anything else? Christ and the Father, okay. I didn't hear that one, never heard that one before, but let's go with it. Christ and the Father, anything else? Well, the entire system of the sanctuary worship, the entire Hebrew economy, I believe, represents the whole system of re redemption. I agree with that, but I'm thinking particularly of the sanctuary. Now, Jesus, as Sister Janet says, and as Mark reiterated, because in, in John chapter 2 and verse 19, Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in two days, three days, I will raise it up. And they said, three, uh, 40 and 6 years was this temple in, in building, and you're going to build it in three days? But the Bible says he was speaking of the temple of his body. And that verse, I hope I gave you the right reference. I think it's chapter 2 and verse 19. If it's not, I'll give you the correct one in just a moment. But, yes, it's John 2 and verse 19. In this verse, Jesus clearly declares that he himself is a, is a reality to which the sanctuary pointed. Is there any other reality that it represented? Well, I hardly believe I'm in a congregation of Adventists. All right, Gary, I hold that one just a minute, Gary. Sister Heather, and Sister Esther. The way that God dealt with sin, that's what um, Brother um, Raman said. But I, I, I mean, uh, that is true. But that's a system, and that's the entire economy of, of the Hebrew economy. Um, Brother Ken at the back. It also represents us. That's what Brother Gary, Gary was saying. The, 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 the temple represents us. Because you all know the verse very well, don't you? What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the living God? It says, God has said, I will do what? I will dwell in them and I will walk in them. The temple was specifically stated to be the dwelling place of God. That's what Paul says here. God says, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them. Your body is a temple of the living God. Paul declares it several places in, the book of, in both books of Corinthians. To the Corinthians. Um, so your body, Jesus Christ. What else? 
I, can, I can't believe nobody said the heavenly sanctuary. I can't... <laughs> In, in, in Hebrews chapter 8, it says that Moses was told that he should build a sanctuary according to the pattern that he was shown in the mount. In the mount. And Paul says, Paul says, um, Paul says, we have a high priest who is a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle that the Lord pitched and not man. And, and then he says that this, this sanctuary, he suggests that this was a pattern that was shown to Moses on the mount. And then later on in, in the same chapter, he says, um, he speaks about the earthly sanctuary, and by implication, there is a heavenly. If, if, if the sanctuary is the dwelling place of God, then logically, heaven is such a place. There has to be such a place in the, in the heaven. So, that's a, that's a third representation of the sanctuary, which is usually the first one that we talk about, which is the one that Adventists know best of all, and emphasize most of all. The heavenly sanctuary, the judgment, the, the books of records, all the rest of it. That's the one we are familiar with. So I expected you to say that first, then Jesus, then the body. <laughs> but it doesn't matter the order. All of them I agree with. And there's one more I'm thinking of. The Bible speaks of one more representation, one more manifestation of the sanctuary. The church, Ephesians 2 and verse 21. We can just look at that because it may be um, the actual phraseology. I want us to read it. Paul says in chapter 2 of Ephesians, he says, I'll read from verse 20. He speaks about us, the people of God. He says, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So the church of God is also the dwelling place of God. Obviously. But it's nice to read it in the Bible, right? Now all of these, you can clearly see, are places where the presence of God dwells in a peculiar sense. Heaven, you the, you the believer, Jesus Christ, and the church. And so we see that the, the representation of the sanctuary as being the dwelling place of God is aptly fulfilled in these four things. Now, when it becomes interesting is when you begin to look at the services of the sanctuary. And I'm going to just give a general idea here that you can think about. I'm not going to dwell on this too much today, but I'd like to just pass the idea on to you. When we look at the sanctuary as heaven, and when we look at the sanctuary as Jesus Christ, what we need to focus on is me in Jesus. Me in Jesus. The, service of the services of the sanctuary represent me in Christ. When I see Jesus as a sanctuary or heaven as a sanctuary. But when I see my body as a sanctuary or the church as a sanctuary, the services of the sanctuary represent Christ in me. Those two truths are realities in the Christian experience. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. In two of those incarnations of the sanctuary, I believe it represents us in Christ. And if we study the sanctuary service from that perspective, we gain a whole lot. And in, and, and in the other two, it represents Christ in us. And similarly, if we represent it this way, it means a lot. Now, Today, as I said, my subject is the sinner in the sanctuary. And I'm going to look at one particular service that took place in the sanctuary. I'm going to ask you to go with me uh, carefully through this service and see what lessons we can learn. The truth is, I always understood that, and I think Ken mentioned this the other night as well, that I, I always understood that the sacrifices represent Jesus Christ. Period. The first time I ever had an inclination that this might not be perfectly right was when my father, who is dead now, he did a study on the burnt offering. And to my amazement, he brought out some ideas that made me recognize that the burnt offering, to a, to a large extent, represents me, the individual. And he used verses like Romans 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore by the 
mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. And he made the point that when you offer a sacrifice to God, what God does is burn it with fire. And he made the point that when we give ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, God's way of showing that he will accept the sacrifice is he's going to burn it with fire. And it made me remember that when I became a Christian, the day I was baptized, two days later, they stole my bike. <laughs> my one little means of transportation. I had it parked in the yard for two years. Nobody troubled it. The day I got baptized, two days later, they took over my little bike. And I was so distraught for the first hour. And then I began to think, I must be a Christian. Because, you know, when you become a Christian and you have this fire and this zeal, you are thinking, is it going to go away? Is it going to go away? And, and when they took the bike, I said, I must be a Christian, otherwise Satan wouldn't attack me like this. And man, then I became, became happy that I had lost the bike. You know, and then I, I noticed over the years, every time I recommit my life to God, I brace myself for it. Something, some fire is going to come. Because it's almost inevitable, it seems like it, it, it is true, that when God accepts your sacrifice, he burns it with fire. Because this is what draws you closer to him. Anyway, that was when I first began to think that maybe not all the sacrifices represent Jesus. And I'm going to ask you to read something with me that reinforces this idea in my mind. Just go to the book of Leviticus and we're going to go to chapters, chapter 3. We'll just read chapter 3, a portion of chapter 3. There are actually a couple of places that we could read. But I'll just read a couple of verses here from chapter 3. Now it says in verse 1. And if, his and if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And I think if you look at verse 6. And, his, and if his offering for a sacrifice of peace offering unto the Lord be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. Now do you see anything peculiar in those verses? Thank you, Sister Janet. I have never ever seen Jesus represented as a female. It has never been done in the scripture. It is the most peculiar, the most unusual thing. I, I, I read this and I thought about it and I left it alone for years. But just now, just recently, it came back to me which, and, I, and I began to think of the signific significance of it. Why would God represent Jesus as a female? The only way that this makes sense in my thinking, when, could, when, it, when would it be possible that you could have a female sacrifice or a male sacrifice? It is if the sacrifice does not represent Jesus but something else. And this is one of the reasons that makes me think that these sacrifices, some of them at any rate, were intended to, to represent not just Jesus exclusively but something else. And I'm going to... I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to right at the beginning read a verse here that gives me the rationale for coming to this conclusion. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. I think Brother Eric read this verse a few nights ago and he might have interpreted it a little differently from my, how I'm going to interpret it now, but I don't think it matters too seriously. In verses 19 and 20, I want you to read with me Hebrews chapter 10. It says, having, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, it says, it actually should read, the holies. To enter into the holies, and it actually, I, I think, refers to the sanctuary itself rather than to any particular apartment. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the sanctuary, I would say, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. What is the new and living way through the veil? His flesh. What was the old and dead way that you could enter the sanctuary? The blood of bulls and goats. The blood of bulls and goats. Somehow, you interacted with the sanctuary through the blood of bulls and goats. Now, now Paul says there is a new and living way that you can enter into the sanctuary. It is, 
It is through the veil, and I don't think he's referring to this second veil, but the first veil, because this is what takes you into the sanctuary itself. You enter into the sanctuary by a new and living way, and that new and living way is through the blood, uh, through the flesh of Jesus. So, here you find that in this verse, the apostle demonstrates that you, the individual, are taken where? Into the sanctuary. How? In Christ. You are taken into the sanctuary in Christ. And I'm going to use that as a basis for saying that when you go back to study the sanctuary, the sacrifices, the services, remember that what Jesus is doing, you are experiencing. Now if you don't put that into the picture, it becomes a legal transaction billions of light years away. But the Bible teaches, in fact we are going to go through the steps of the sanctuary here and we are going to see how how everything applies to us. Well, some of the things. We can't really look at everything, but some of the things. Now, first of all, look at the layout of the sanctuary. I'm sure we're all familiar with it, but I just want to refresh our minds because I want to be sure that as we go through, I'm not referring to things that you are not conscious of what we're talking about. Now, first of all, you had the layout of the sanctuary. which uh, You had a courtyard, which was... As God designed it in the sanctuary, it was a courtyard, a, a yard space that was surrounded by white linen. Is that right? They had posts and they had a linen, linen wall, linen curtain right around. Now, at one end, at the eastern end, there was an opening. There was a kind of gate. And when you entered through this gate, the first thing you'd see is what? It was an altar, and it was an altar made of brass, a huge structure. In fact, there were steps that you could climb upon this altar by. And that is where the sacrifices were offered. Passing the altar, heading towards the west, towards the sanctuary itself, which is this building, this rectangle here. What was the next thing you came upon? Something called a laver, which was a huge brazen basin with water where washing took place. Passing the laver... You now enter the sanctuary itself. Through a curtain here, another opening, you came into the sanctuary itself. And on the southern side of the sanctuary, that is this side, what would, what, what would you find? There was a seven-branched candlestick. On the right side, on the northern side, what would you find? You'd find the table of showbread with 12 loaves of bread on it. And then at the western end of this, this first apartment, which was called the Holy Place... What would you find at the western end? The altar of incense, which is where incense was burned. And then there was another dividing curtain. And beyond this curtain, you came to the apartment that was called the most holy place. The holy of holies. And inside this apartment, what would you find? The Ark of the Covenant, which was a, a gold-plated box covered by a slab of pure gold in which was contained the Ten Commandments. It was specifically designed to contain the Ten Commandments. And on the top of it, there was a carving of two angels, carved from pure gold. And of course, when the presence of God was in Israel, there was always a supernatural light shining between these two angels, which was referred to as a Shekinah light. A supernaturally maintained light, placed there by God, maintained by God, without any human influence or input. So this was the layout of the sanctuary. Now, this sanctuary, as, as a couple of people said, represented the, 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 the salvation plan. In great detail, the plan of salvation is outlined here. The problem is that we often misunderstand the pieces of it. Now, the moment you entered this courtyard, you entered the history of salvation. Now I want to make something, I want to get something clear in our minds from the beginning. When does this sanctuary system begin? In actual reality. When did it actually begin? The reality, not the, not the type. Somebody says Adam's fall. When Jesus went to heaven, from the foundation of the world, And the covenant was made in heaven. I have an opinion, and I haven't heard my opinion yet, so I'm waiting on it. All right. 
I'm going to tell you my opinion, right? What, what is the first thing in the song theory? The altar. When did that actually happen? At the cross. Salvation history never began before Jesus came here. All that happened before was promise. All that happened before was promise and representation. Now, I, I have a, a message tomorrow that I hope will demonstrate this more clearly. But all that happened before Jesus came here was promise, representation, hope, expectation. You know, before Jesus came here, Satan had a big argument with God. He went up there in the days of Job and argued with God. He had his, he had his rights and he had his points. Nothing had been done. It had only been promised. That is why when, when Michael came to, to, to raise up Moses, Satan presented himself. Moses was not saved. Salvation had not taken place. Nothing happened before Jesus came here. And when you read the New Testament, and you read it with an open mind, that is what you find there. The beginning of salvation. That is why the Bible says that of all those who were born of women, the greatest was John the Baptist. But the least in the kingdom is greater than he. All the law and the prophets were until John, but since that time what? The kingdom of God is preached. It says the law was given by Moses, but what? Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now this is something that I know raises questions in your minds. You can hold them. But I'm, I'm telling you, this is my, what I believe in reading the Bible. And I believe that you, it can be demonstrated very clearly. Now, it's an important reason why I'm making this point. Salvation history began at the cross. Before that, you had promise. But the reality of it began at the cross. And if you just think about this, you, you can see that I'm telling the truth. The beginning of... The representation of salvation. Where was salvation first represented in the history of Israel? When did it begin? Abraham, Isaac, in a way, but that was Abraham and Isaac. But I mean in Israel as a people. In the wilderness. Okay, let me tell you my, my thought again. I think it began the day they were delivered from Egypt. It began with the Passover. That was the first festival that God gave them, the Passover. Every year they lived out salvation history. Passover, unleavened bread, wave sheaf, fast, trumpets, atonement, tabernacles. Next year they did it again. Next year they did it again. They lived out the history of salvation. It began with Passover. It ended with tabernacles. And in between, you had the different steps in the work of Jesus Christ. So, the beginning of salvation history is the Passover. And the Passover is when Jesus died. So, this, this, the whole sanctuary system, in actual reality, never actually began until Jesus died. All you had before that was representation or promise. Now, why am I making this point? There are some people who believe that this part of the sanctuary represents the Old Testament. And this part represents the New Testament. And so, therefore, what they have to do, if you come to that conclusion, you have to put the cross right here. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? If the sanctuary represents two ages, Old Covenant and New Covenant, then you have to put the cross right at this veil. And you have to say that this part of the sanctuary represents how God worked in the Old Testament times, while this part of the sanctuary represents the experience of the New Testament. I, I, I know that it is, it is tempting to think this way. But the reality is that the cross takes place before anything happens in any of these apartments. So this has to represent the New Testament age because it's after the cross. And this has to represent also the New Testament age because both parts of the sanctuary represent after the cross and the cross is here. So 
If the sanctuary is a timeline, which it is, then you can't have the cross here. It has to be here. So, the sanctuary is a New Testament experience. And that's why I believe, I, 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 don't, I don't accept every interpretation that Adventism presents. Because some things go like the, 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 way, the way of the, 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 the Trinity. Some things have happened like how the Trinity has happened. But, I accept that there is a Day of Atonement and there is another experience and that is represented by these two apartments. Now tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit about the Day of Atonement. But I want to talk today more about the general sanctuary system. So we're going to start at this part and we see Jesus dying here. Now, I'm going to read, ask you to read with me from Leviticus chapter 4 where it talks about the sin offering. And we're going to look at the specifications of the offering. Leviticus 4. I'll read, uh, I have to read about 12 verses, so please bear with me. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them, and then he goes on to mention the priest, but it was also true for the common person. Same, same ritual. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish, unto the Lord for a sin offering. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall take up the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. Now look at what happens. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. So he sprinkles the blood here. That's the first thing we are told he's to do to the blood. Take it in here and sprinkle it seven times right at this point. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation. So he takes some, and this horn here, this altar here had four horns, four corners. He's to take some of the blood and he's to touch the horns of the, the altar. Strange. And shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. All the blood, it says, is to be poured out here. But obviously it's not all the blood because there's still a little bit to be sprinkled here and to be touched on the horns of the altar. But everything else is to be poured out right here. And he shall take off from it all the fat of the bullock for the sin offering, the fat that cover the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, I think that's a midriff. With the kidneys, it shall he take away. Man, strange. I mean, God tells you to dissect this animal. To, to, to dismember it, and dissect it, and take out the little bits and pieces, and you have to do this with some parts, and this with some parts. And do you know... Everything is intended to convey a meaning. God is, doesn't just want these people to get their hands bloody. He's trying to teach lessons and that's the amazing thing about it. As it was taken off from the bullock of the sacrifice of peace offerings and the priest shall burn them upon the altar of the burnt offering. These things are fat, the kidneys, the midriff. The, uh, he's to take it and he's to burn it on this altar. Everything is to be burned on this altar. But that's not the end of it. And the skin of the bullock and all his flesh with his head and with his legs and his inwards and his dung. Even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out. And burn him on the wood with fire where the ashes are poured out shall he be burnt. So the rest of the animal, most of the animal is to be taken away from the sanctuary, away from the camp and it's to be burned to ashes. Man, it's the strangest thing. And I'll tell you something. When you look at, just by the way, when I read the Bible and I see things like this, sometimes, you know, I like to think like, I like to put myself in the place of the unbeliever, the skeptic. You know, and you think, what is all this about? And, 
the, 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 the simple response is to just brush it aside as meaningless mumbo jumbo. But then you begin to think about it and you think, who designed this? Who put it together? Did Moses really sit down and invent all of this and tell, uh, why, why would somebody do something like this? Why would a human being do something like this? The point I'm making, it is evident to me just from the detail and the, the extreme particulars that this was carefully designed by a very, very intelligent person and that everything is intended to carry some deep meaning. I mean, it builds my faith in the Bible even when I don't fully understand it. Now, this is what was supposed to happen. And I, I'm going to, uh, as I said, I'm going to first of all now look at this from the perspective. I'm going to look at it from the perspective that what happened to Jesus happened to us. That's the perspective I want to look at this from this morning. Because my topic is a sinner in the sanctuary. Now, the first thing that happens when you become a Christian, you enter into the enclosure of the courtyard. Or you're about to become a Christian. Let me put it this way. The white linen surrounding you illustrates righteousness, doesn't it? And it signifies that you have stepped into the arena of righteousness. The moment you turn your face towards the sanctuary and you enter into that kind of enclosure, you have, you have entered into the experience of righteousness. The beginning of the pathway towards reconciliation with God. That has, that has started. The first thing that happens is that the animal is slain here. Now, here is what... I'd like us to go to Romans chapter 6 and read what it says there. In just a couple of verses. It says, beginning in verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now when the Bible says, know ye not, it's asking you to take cognizance, to be aware of what? Brother Abraham, can you know something that is not true? No, you might think so. You might think it is so. But no. Is, is, is related to the word knowledge. You cannot know what is not true. If you know something, knowledge is based on fact. So when you know something, it is because it, it is true. You might think you know something that is false, but you cannot truly know something unless it is a fact. That's why Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Now Paul says, don't you know this? Fact. He's asking you to take cognizance of a fact. That if you were baptized into Jesus, you were baptized into his death. This means that if you were baptized into Christ, you have entered into the experience of his death. Many people should be dead when they are still alive. Why? Because they don't know the truth. Jesus says if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. So he's asking you to take take note of a fact he says uh, in verse 6 again he uses the same word knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin these are facts and the Bible is talking about facts God is not, uh, not telling us to, 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 to conceptualize fictitious things or to psych ourselves into a state where we actually persuade ourselves of a, of a falsehood. He's saying, believe it is so, know it is so, because it is fact. When Jesus died, you died. If you are in Christ. And if you know this truth, you will experience his death. So what happened is that when the Lamb died here, when Jesus died on Calvary, you died on Calvary if you are in Christ. That is fact. That is not theory. It's fact. That's what Paul is saying. And, and the entire, you know, a friend of mine read Romans 6, he and I, many years ago. 
could never come to grips with it because I tried and tried and tried to kill myself. I don't mean physically. But the Bible says I am dead. The Bible says I'm to reckon it to be so. The Bible says I'm to know it to be so. And I tried to convince myself that I should die. And you can try all the devices that you can think of to kill self and it won't work. The Bible says not, you're not to try to die. You are to believe the reality. You are to believe that it happened. You are to identify with the truth. And when you know the truth, Jesus says the truth will make you free. Now that is a fact. If you're a part of Christ, you don't live. And we're not going to talk about that today, but I just want you to know that. So when Jesus, when, when, when Jesus died here at the cross, you died. And so the Bible says that the blood is to be poured out at the base of the altar. How much of the blood? All the blood. That's what it says. All the blood is to be poured out at the base of the altar. Your life is poured out. Blood represents life, doesn't it? We have, to, we have to translate the symbols. Blood represents life. So what it says, like Paul says, your old man is crucified with Jesus. At that moment, as surely as Jesus died, so are you to be dead as far as sin is concerned. Now what is the next step in the sanctuary? Look at it and tell me. Baptism, uh, uh, Brother Eric says, and I agree, baptism is represented by what? Now you have to explain to me what baptism means. Burial and resurrection. Burial and resurrection. I'm glad you said res resurrection. If you died here, what follows is burial. But don't forget resurrection. Don't forget. Now Jesus also passed through the liver. Because remember, he's the one who is, the, who, who is doing it. Uh, and we're experiencing it, right? Jesus died and why, what, what does the water symbolize here? Cleansing by what means? By the Holy Spirit. Water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that Jesus was raised from the dead. How? By the glory of the Father or by the Spirit of God. This represents the interaction with the Spirit that produces the new life. Now notice something. The priest takes something in here. He takes something from the sacrifice in here. What does he take? A little bit of the blood. Now it says that all the blood was to be poured out at the base of the altar. But some blood goes into the sanctuary. What kind of blood is it? In terms of our discussion. What kind of blood is it? Life. Yeah, life. 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 I'm just looking for a little bit extra. Another little word. Cleansing blood getting close to it it's new life that's almost it it's resurrected life it's resurrected life that goes into the sanctuary isn't that true the, the dead life the, the, the blood that represents death is poured out at the foot of the altar but anything that goes into the sanctuary has to be resurrected life if blood represents life dead life cannot go in here now I know we have represented it to say that it is sin that is being taken into the sanctuary. And I agree that sins are recorded. But we have said that blood represents sin being taken into the sanctuary. If you can find that in the illustration, then you can show it to me. But blood, the Bible says, represents life. What we see, any life that goes into the heavenly sanctuary has to be resurrected life. What does it say in Ephesians chapter 2? And verses 6 and 8, it says that we sit where? In heavenly places where? In Christ Jesus. How did we get into heavenly places? Because Jesus Christ is in heavenly places. The Bible says he died unto sin once, but now he liveth unto God. The resurrected life that goes into the sanctuary is the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. And you and I go in with him by this new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil. That is his flesh. So when Jesus goes in here, the blood that he takes is resurrected life. And it is my life that goes into the sanctuary. Now the life that goes into the sanctuary is sprinkled here and is put on the four horns of the altar. Now, there are certain carefully chosen articles of furniture. God designed and chose and put them there for a very good reason. And he wants us to learn something. 
on the, on the southern side there is the candlestick with the twelve with the seven branches now what does this represent it represents the ministry of the Holy Spirit the ministry to who the ministry to the church the ministry to you the individual now in this part of the sanctuary what God is saying is that as long as your life even heavenly life even though we sit in heavenly places even though we are resurrected with Christ and we live in heavenly places there are certain vital ingredients that are necessary for our survival what are they? look in this apartment and see what is there what do we see? and what is the bread of life? It is the word of God and in a, in, in a special sense, sense it represents Jesus. But in, in the sense of our experience, what we are talking about is the actual word of God. Can you survive as a Christian without the, reading the word of God? If, if it's very unusual circumstances, you're locked up in prison and you don't have a Bible, I'm sure God will sustain you. But under normal circumstances, God has appointed that the, 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 the written word should be our sustenance how often does this have to be changed these loaves of bread every Sabbath alright all right. but I know that the, the oil the, 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 this, this um, the light of the candlestick how often was it to be burning it was never to go out the experience of the Holy Spirit was to be maintained perpetually, perennially. It was never to be diminished, never to go out. And the word of God was to be a continuum, a continual thing in the experience of the believer. And then, what about the altar? But prayer. Prayer. And how often was, how, how, how often was the incense to burn morning and evening and also the fire that kept the incense burning and I'm going to comment on this in a little bit the fire that kept the incense burning was never to go out now interestingly the blood is sprinkled right here at this veil this, if this blood represents the life of the believer and it has to because if you think that this represents the blood of Jesus there is no limitation, never is and never can be any limitation between Jesus and the Father. Never can be. But the blood is only sprinkled in front of this veil. The life that is represented by this blood cannot go beyond the veil. And that is a puzzle. But there's a reason that I'm going to explain more carefully tomorrow. That's one of the things that... Um, people who disagree with the Adventist perspective they have a problem because they say there's no longer any veil between us and God and in a, in a sense this is true in a sense this is true we sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus God has no reservations against us there should be no barriers between us and God but effectively there is effectively there is and I'm going to talk about that tomorrow and God recognizes this reality and he has made provision for it and he's going to deal with it but if you think there's no no barrier between you and God today I don't think you're a realist if somebody in here lives and has the power of Jesus Christ then you can uh, if you stand up against what I just said then I will back off but I don't know anybody in here who is in that condition and that alone tells me that there is some kind of barrier it is not on God's side, but it exists. And that reality is, is represented in this, in this sanctuary symbol in that the blood can only go this far until the Day of Atonement. Now, I'm going to try to look at some of the things in particular that happened. Now, the, the, the animal was slain or the sinner is killed and the Bible says take out his fat take out his kidney take out his midriff and you, you burn it in fire on the altar but the rest of his body his dung his foot his skin take it outside the camp and burn it to ashes and brother Ken made a point the other night that everything that pertains to the old life 
is to be burned in this life. Now, when we come to Jesus, we come with all kinds of things. Some things are useful in the cause of God. Some things don't have any use. I, I believe fat represents excesses. Excess. And there are certain kinds of organs. I don't know exactly what each thing represents. Like I say, this all needs more careful study. But here's my superficial idea. I believe that the organs that were burned on the altar, the fat and the rest of it represents what can be used to the glory of God. When you come to Jesus and you present your body as a living sacrifice, you come with money, you come with talents, you come with abilities, you come with influence, you put what is useful on the altar and it is given to God. And the Bible says that he consumes it. It is burned in the fire. It is offered up to God. And the Bible says it's a sweet smell, a sweet smell to God. But what about the rest of the old life that is no good to God and that has been carrying it on? What happens to it? The Bible says you have to take it outside the camp and it is to be burned to ashes. It is never to come back into your experience. So those two aspects, I believe, and, and not only this, but the physical body in a very real sense. If you look at the apostles, and you look at all those heroes for God, what happened to their physical bodies? Peter was crucified upside down, right? Um, Stephen was stoned to death. I think Andrew was ripped to pieces by a mob in Athens. Paul was beheaded. I don't think any one of them, maybe John, possibly died a natural death. They all their bodies were destroyed in the cause of God outside the camp not within the history of salvation but out there in the heathen world they were destroyed for the cause of God now I believe that this is at least partially what is represented here in the sanctuary ritual notice that it is fire that consumes it in both cases now fire is represented in the sanctuary several places it burns at this altar it burns at this altar and it burns here a candlestick. Now fire has a twofold purpose. One, fire represents extreme difficulty. It can come from persecution. It can come from trials and tribulation, hardship, deprivation. But fire represents the elements that God uses to bring about purification. Is that right? Yes. What does too much fire do? It devours, it destroys. But if you have enough fire and a controlled fire, what it does is it purifies. If it comes against good material, it will purify. If you put it in the trash, it will soon become a blaze and consume everything. So, fire is represented all throughout the sanctuary. And what it tells me, it tells me something. It tells me that in the Christian's experience, the element of fire is a necessity in the plan of salvation fire is a necessity if your life is easy and comfortable go to God and find out where you're not within his will because the apostle says that all who live godly in Christ Jesus what? shall suffer persecution Jesus says I have come to do what on this earth I have come to kindle a fire on the earth I have come to kindle a fire on the earth. And he talks about how from this time a man's foe shall be there of his own household. He talks about, you see, there's a spirit in this planet. And it pervades the atmosphere. It fills every place and it is not the spirit of God. Here you introduce a different principle. You begin to introduce God into this planet. You think Satan goes to sleep? And God allows him to roar and he allows him to spit his fire because... How you respond to this situation brings glory to God. Not only brings glory to God, but it also helps to purify your own experience. God uses it as a tool to chisel you to become what he wants you to be. If you notice here in the, in, in, in the holy place, the fire burns on the altar. When does the prayer go up? When does the incense go up? When you put fire on it. Okay. Every day I pray for my, my children. I pray for my friends. I pray for my brethren. My wife calls me and she says, Dave has had an accident. He's in intensive care at the hospital. 
Every morning I've been saying, Lord, please bless Dave and help to keep him. Now suddenly it's different. Now I don't get up off my knees. I don't go to sleep tonight. The incense is rising. It's rising with fervor and with power because the fire is burning. Fire makes us pray. Now remember God says that the, incense, the fire here on this altar was to burn. How often? It was never to go out. Maybe one of the reasons why our prayers are so feeble and ineffective is that there is no fire. There's no fire. There's no reason to pray other than just the bare. We go through the form of prayer. We mount the platitudes, but there's no feeling, nothing behind it because there is no fire burning. In fact, you know, Jesus made a suggestion that seems to suggest that we ourselves should stoke the fire. We should keep it burning. We can, by our own impetus, keep that fire burning because he said, if any man will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself and what? Take up the cross. And the cross is a symbol of what? Death. It's a symbol of death. It's a symbol of self-denial, of dying voluntarily by your own choice. What it means is de depriving and denying myself a form of fire for God's sake. And when you begin to live this kind of way, those who deny self know that the, the more you deny self, the closer it tends to bind you to God when you are doing it for God's sake. There is a suggestion that you can bring this, this gentle fire that is here at the altar of incense. You can bring it into your own experience. And Jesus says you should. Deny yourself, take up the cross and follow him. And this should be your experience every day. And when this is your experience every day, you find that the incense goes up. Now notice that these are three elements that are essential in the Christian life. You might sit in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. If you deny prayer, if you neglect prayer, and you neglect the study of the word, and you don't have the living experience of the Holy Spirit in your life, even though you sit in heavenly places, you will die spiritually. Because as long as our worship is in this section here, those are the means ordained of God to sustain our spiritual life. That is what it means. These are God's ordained means of sustaining that spiritual life. Neglect any of them at our peril. Some people nibble the word of God every, every two days, every, every, every other week. Once a week when they go to church on Sabbath or whenever. But this teaches us that the bread should be there constantly and renewed frequently. Every day we need to have these elements in our lives. Yes. I mean, in, in everything that we are looking at here, one thing to remember is that Jesus is said to be our forerunner. And in a, he is even more than our forerunner. He is our... I don't know. I, I can't think of a proper word to describe it. The, 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 the reality is that all of these experiences are not ours. They are Jesus' experiences. What we are doing is participating in something that has already happened. That's what salvation really is. I grew up with the thinking that Jesus was my substitute. But that is not the correct word at all in the context of how I'm trying to present it. Substitute means that he does it, I don't have to do it. But it's more like he did it, and now I enter into him and I am experiencing it. It's not substitution, it's participation. I don't know if that's the right word, but that's the concept of salvation that has enveloped my mind and is taking me over. Now, when I'm seeing it this way, Jesus is everything. I cannot exist nor survive without him. I discovered on my own that I can't do these things. I found it out myself. You know, like Luther said, if monkish works could have made a righteous monks, he would have been that monk. I say if effort and endeavor could have made a righteous person, I should have been that person. All my efforts brought me lower. The only hope I ever found was when I discovered I don't have to be perfect. No! I have to enter into the perfect one. That was such a relief, man. It was a wash of relief when that hit me that morning in my kitchen. I don't have to be perfect. My wife thought I was going crazy. 
but I can enter into the perfect one and experience his perfection. That was such a relief. It gave me such a rest. My fighting was finished. What I need to do is to learn how to be a part of him. And what we see here in the sanctuary is Jesus doing it and us participating. So what David said there about us being um, you know, unable to do it. But Jesus has done it. Our fight is a fight of faith. The faith to believe the truth. Because when we believe the truth, it will make us free. So, some of the blood is put on the horns of the altar. And horns represent what? Power. Strength. What it tells me is that the life of the sinner is applied to the power of prayer. The power of the Christian, while this is the place where we are, the power of the Christian is focused on prayer. And that stands to reason, because what power do you have? None. All the power is in Christ. But prayer is a channel, it's a connection between us and, uh, us and Him. It's a connection between us and heavenly places. So, the power of the life, the resurrected life, the power of the resurrected life is inextricably linked to prayer. And we know this to be a fact, but it's nice to be reminded of it by looking at this illustration. So, when we look at the sanctuary, the sinner in the sanctuary in this way, it makes a big difference. Now, I think my time is just about up on what else I have to, to say I have to leave it for tomorrow. But I'll say one more thing. This, this other thing that I'm going to say is related to what I was trying to say yesterday and the day before. And it should, it, we should be able to see the reality of this without me emphasizing it too much. Now in the old system, this service did what for the sinner? It brought forgiveness. Thank you, Sister Janet. It brought forgiveness. The old system only brought forgiveness. What did it not bring? It could not bring cleansing. Do I need to read that? The old covenant is about forgiveness. The new covenant is about something else. Because forgiveness never solved the, 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 the issue. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 10. Let's just read quickly and see what the Bible teaches about how little it did to solve the problem. Hebrews 10, I'll read verse 1. It says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, notice good things to come, they had not yet come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereon to perfect. That is God's plan, that the worshiper should be perfect. The law could not do it. Because if it had done it, look at verse 2. For then... Would they not have ceased to be offered if they had made the worshippers perfect? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. So every year they remembered sin. Why? Because you got forgiven this year, next year you went and did it again. You got forgiven that year, you went and did it the following year. So every year there was a remembrance of sin because the law, forgiveness cannot deal with sin. You're a thief and you keep on stealing my things and I keep forgiving you. Man, you will come back and do it perpetually. What you need is your thieving nature to be changed. You don't need forgiveness, you need transformation, you need cleansing. The blood of bulls and goats could not do this. This was representation. And if we, if we transfer the system of mere forgiveness to the new covenant, we are living in a past representative system. And we don't know the truth. This is the truth. Reading from the same passage. In fact, let's go back to chapter 9. And read verse 14. It says, How much more shall the blood or the life, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works 
to serve the living God. Again go over to chapter 10. It says again from verse 4. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Therefore when he cometh into the world he said sacrifices and offering thou wouldest not. Why? Why, why would he have no pleasure in sacrifices and offerings for sin? Because they did not do the job. God had no pleasure in them. So what does he say? But a body hast thou prepared me. Who is this me and who is this body? Jesus Christ. And what will he do? He will fulfill the will of God. Which is to do what? Which is to take away sin. Which is to cleanse the conscience from dead works. And so it says. Verse 9. Then said he. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, the first that could not do God's will, that he might establish the second. By the which will, the will of God that he came to do, by the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Not every year, not time after time, not perpetually coming to repent, Confess, sin and repent, sin and repent, but once and for all. And look at what it says in verse, is it 14? And I'll stop here. For by one offering, he has perfected forever, past tense, them that are sanctified. So, that's the final point I wanted to make, that Jesus' work does the job. And we can't take the typical representations and just transfer them without reapplying the symbols in the greater and more realistic way. If you think it's just about forgiveness, you'll keep on sinning for eternity. But when you understand what Jesus did and you believe it, we will experience that cleansing. God bless you and thank you for your attentiveness. Let us pray.